telcos, manufacturers, multinational companies, SMEs, DLCs, ministries, agencies, and statutory bodies. Our MIDA, MIDA stands for Malaysian Investment Development Authority. Uh, our rep uh, in Sydney and Chicago, Chicago, I think it is night time now uh, in Chicago. Uh, and our embassy staff in Beijing and Singapore are also in the list. Um, I noticed that uh, President Mapku also, Datuk Paramjit, is with us. Uh, Mapku stands for Malaysian Association of Private Colleges and Universities. Uh, public and private universities representative. Also universities from the region, including nine universities from Indonesia. Um, some are following through live uh, Facebook, uh, in particular uh, graduate students and uh, academia at large. Ladies and gentlemen, as we all know, the theme for this forum is empowering industry players to boost competitiveness through digitalization. We have three main reasons for having this theme. One, to enlighten us with the big picture of the recently launched national for our art policy vis-a-vis -vis my digital blueprint and other development blueprints such as shared prosperity, shared prosperity vision 2020 and five-year Malaysia plans or better known as 12 Malaysia plan. Second, to enlighten us industry players in particular, the opportunities made available by the government and the market in adopting the emerging technology as reflected in 1010 Malaysian Science Technology Innovation and Economy, or in short, 1010 MISD framework. Third, to define the role of universities and research institutions together with the government and industry in refining policy implementation through research and development, considering the rapid technology and industry dynamics locally and at the international level. To cover the theme of this webinar, we are bringing here to you three eminent panelists, as mentioned by the MC. And this um, webinar will be uh, in three sessions. In the first session, each panelist has uh, 20 minutes. And in the second session has five minutes each. Third session is for Q&A for about 20, 25 minutes before we conclude. So ladies and gentlemen, let's begin. I have the great pleasure to invite Dr. Amisa to say her ministry's perspective on the theme for 20 minutes. So dengan hormatnya dipersilakan Dr. Amisa. The floor is yours. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi taala wabarakatuh. Salam sejahtera. Terima kasih kepada UKM yang telah menjemput saya untuk uh, majlis pada hari ini. The Second Digital Economy Forum UKM Empowering Industrial Players to Boost Competitiveness Through Digitalization. Yang bahagia Profesor Datuk Ikwan Haji Toriman, Nak Chancellor Universiti Kebangsaan Malaysia. Yang bahagia Datuk Profesor Ghazali Abbas, my ex-boss dulu di KPT. Tuan-tuan dan puan-puan sekalian, first and foremost, thank you for inviting me to this event. And I must congratulate everyone for hosting this event. Uh, this is the second Digital Economy Forum at UKM. Um, next, please. Um, today, I'm going to cover mostly on the ecosystem of innovation in the country. But before that, uh, please allow me to share with everyone the global innovation landscape and where we are as a country. We are ranked uh, number 33 out of 131 countries uh, in GII Index 2020. Uh, where are our strength? Uh, we are the most innovative country after China out of 37 middle income countries. Um, if we look at where we are, we have been in this position uh, as a middle income country for the longest time. And China now and uh, is ahead of us. And we noticed that there are other countries in Southeast Asia, for example, Vietnam and Thailand, they are catching up. 
our overall score, 33, is not too bad, but we have been uh, where uh, other countries have been. Uh, that is number 27 in the world, and uh, we kind of slide down, and we need to really look at where we can improve ourselves. Next, please. And this is indicators where we are, where we are doing very well, and we need to continue to do well. And there are also areas that we need to really focus and improve. For example, is of starting business. We are number 97 out of 131. Trademarks by origin, meaning to say we do not have our local technologies that many, that we are number 93.7. I think... Uh, we can do a lot to improve this. In fact, good financial uh, by abroad uh, still behind. Um, this is something that we need to look at and improve as a country, a uh, whole government effort. Next, please. We have several policies uh, from Shed uh, Prosperity Vision, and we have Industrial Master Plan 20. Uh, 16, 2020, and we even have the fourth industrial revolution under MITI. And recently, uh, MOSTI, together with EPU, launched national fourth industrial revolution for IR policy. Uh, that was uh, early last month. And early this year, Malaysia launched Malaysia Digital Economy Blueprint. And last year, we launch uh, DASA Science, Technology and Innovasi Negara, where in this DASA we link science, technology and innovation to economy. Next, please. Under the National Fourth uh, Industrial Revolution for IR, the areas uh, we are focusing in uh, in manufacturing, transportation or logistic, education, agriculture, utilities, tourism, wholesale, retail, uh, finance, insurance, those are the areas. And the five foundational technologies that we are focusing in is the artificial intelligence, that is the brain, the brain of the whole thing. Internet of Things, blockchain, cloud, uh, advanced material. Next, please. And MOSTI plays an uh, important role here as MOSTI is uh, spearheading one of the clusters that is on emerging technology. And under this, uh, several agencies and ministries are being uh, roped in to work with us. Uh, looking at for the next five, 10 years, what are the emerging technologies, the disruptive technologies that the government need to fund in order for us to to move forward and become a high-tech nation. This is really important because we need to get ourselves ready. As, as we know now, as we are facing pandemic, um, these technologies are being used, even though it is it's about healthcare, but uh, big data is being used, artificial intelligence is being used. Um, for US to come up with the polio vaccine, it took them 20 years, but uh, for for COVID-19, for the past uh, two, one or two years, they managed to come up with several vaccines, as, as we know, I'm sure some, most of you have taken your vaccination, right? That include, uh, you know, manufacturing in other sites and uh, coming up with the same quality, same efficacies for the vaccines. Next, please. And under MOSTI, as I highlighted earlier on, uh, is the National Science, Technology and Innovation Policy. And here, uh, Academy of Sciences identified 10 science and technology drivers versus uh, 10 Malaysia socioeconomic drivers. Um, this is uh, not only vertical, but also horizontal, and is covering all aspects of our life from our daily life, health care, and our work. And if we look at these metrics, it, uh, it will, um, if you look at it carefully, it will produce at least 100 new technologies. The technologies here include uh, sensor technology uh, and also advanced materials. Advanced materials is important. As we know, uh, graphene uh, is being used in our handphone and all that. And ENE, -E, where we, we have our own semiconductor company, uh, Malaysian company, uh, Celtera. Um, and for the next 10 years, 
the semiconductor is going to be an industry uh, whereby it, it will it will not see a sunset because every gadgets that we use, all the system, all the hardware, it has semiconductor. So the ten, I don't have to read all these ten uh, technologies that you can see here. Uh, from neurotechnology, blockchain, uh, artificial intelligence, which should cover the uh, socioeconomic drivers that is energy, businesses, culture and arts, medical, healthcare, smart technology, smart uh, cities, water, agriculture, forestry, education, and environmental biodiversity. Uh, all these technologies that is being identified is uh, all these are needed, especially now when we are facing the pandemic. Uh, we need um, high tech but low touch to to make sure that infection will be reduced. And this is the challenge. Uh, it can be seen as a challenge, but it can be seen as opportunities. How we look at it depends on how how one would uh, would uh, view it. Next, please. Uh, out of the 100 technologies, uh, mostly identified 30 of them that we should be focusing rather than all the 10 by 10. There are 30 technologies that we believe is game changing. Uh, our resources is limited and we need to focus, uh, as you know, focus and focus that will uh, give us a greater impact. At the end of the day, it's about the impact. And when we look at all the 10 uh, socioeconomic drivers and also the, the technology that has been identified, these are the areas mostly is focusing in terms of funding research and also in terms of funding uh, startups in the country. Next, please. Along with the National Science, Technology and Innovation uh, policy that is linked to economy, as I highlighted earlier on, uh, we are developing a roadmap, technology roadmap. This is the one that is going to make a break because through this roadmap, we have the action plans, the timeline, what needs to be done and who should do it. And, and at mostly we have one council that is National Science Council uh, chaired by Prime Minister twice a year. And we have another council, which is High Tech Nation Council. And these are uh, the, the platform that we create for new technologies, emerging technologies, and the roadmap to be deliberated and, and uh, discussed. And recently, we had one uh, meeting on, United, on uh, High Tech Nation Council. There's a lot of areas that we need to really focus uh, in terms of funding uh, this research, funding this startup, funding these technologies. When we compare ourselves to Vietnam, for example, or Indonesia, um, the percentage of local content uh, from our country in terms of product is quite low compared to this these two countries, Indonesia and uh, Vietnam, for example, if I'm not mistaken, they have more than 50% local content. For us, uh, it's less than 40%. So this is about funding our local uh, products, uh, meaning to say it might be uh, slow and, cha uh, and challenging, but this is what China and also Korea and uh, Japan did in the 70s. For example, for Korea, for Korea, and they got to where they are now. So it's about funding our local technologies and also startups. Uh, I listed here the 14 technology roadmaps. Uh, some of them are still in the pipeline. Some of them has been, has been uh, presented and still waiting for it to be presented at a higher level. Um, there's one interesting roadmap that is roadmap for startup. This is to provide a platform, the ecosystem. Yeah? And this ecosystem basically helps startup. It's like, it's like one stop center. There's no wrong door. Uh, if there's a startup that need assistance, this is where they should go. And um, Cradle is leading this and it should be launched soon. And this is where we help them from getting the funding. Uh, sometimes the barriers are not only funding, but also policies and regulatories. And this is where uh, our job at MOSTI and our agencies uh, to facilitate them 
And uh, on the right hand side here, you can see some of the technologies locally. I'm very proud that these are locally uh, developed and produced uh, technologies. Uh, there's one uh, robo farm used to spray uh, pesticide for our chilies. And then uh, there's one uh, robot machikia used at the hospital, robot at the Pasa Ipo and several others. And, and and we hope one day we will have our own unicorn. I know recently it's been announced, uh, Carson might be approaching there to become a unicorn. And there are several others. It is not by chance, it has to be by design. And the role of the government is to facilitate, to support and sponsor some of these startup. Next, please. Uh, at the national level, mostly fund uh, research grant, uh, those from TRL3 onward, uh, is, is different from uh, the higher education research grant where mostly are fundamental, but we are looking more of experimental development products or research that can be used immediately in the industry. And if you look at this uh, whole chain, uh, from the research grant that they receive, we do have uh, funding and there are also venture capitals uh, that can come in and help our, our startup. We have MathCap, uh, one of the VCs, and also KMP. We have Cradle and MTDC. Those are the agencies that, that help to fund and assist the, the growth and development of our startup. We also, uh, uh, we are also trying to transform, and this has been announced by the minister on TCA, yeah, technology commercialization uh, uh, accelerate uh, acceleration, yeah, accelerator that accelerate uh, technology commercialization that is being led by um, Technology Park Malaysia. Next, please. And these are the initiatives under the NTIS. I'm sure you have heard NTIS. We started to, to roll this one out last year and several companies has benefited from this. We received more than 2000 uh, applications and uh, more than 300 companies and universities have benefited from this uh, funding. And we also have our uh, Malaysia Grand Challenge uh, Malaysia Grand Challenges announced by YBKJ. These are the, the research grant uh, given to MOSTI to, to be sort of uh, used by our local companies and universities. Uh, under Cradle, they had uh, Ignite and Accelerate uh, last year. And I'm sure Puan Rafiza will uh, explain further on this. Next, please. A mostly national grand challenge and fund facilitation. Uh, this is uh, in greater detail. Uh, we had opened it up, uh, if I'm not mistaken, starting January, and we start processing in April. Um, the challenges, the main challenge that I, I we face when processing all this uh, funding facilitation, um, most of the application do not meet the requirement of at least the RL3, yeah, where this is experimental uh, proof of concept and all that being being uh, done already. Uh, we are looking for something that is game changing, uh, disruptive technology. Uh, gone are the days when we we fund all those lotion and all those. Uh, kind of products. Now we are looking at what is it that uh, we can come up with yeah, based on the research and also uh, proof of concept that has been done by our researchers. And it's quite competitive. Next, please. Uh, we have spoke of the technologies from AI to uh, blockchain and then the funding, the ecosystem. Uh, the support given by the government, we we really focus on the support because we know that at this early stage, early stage development of of uh, startup, government funding is really really important. Uh, I don't think any company just can just go and and develop on their own. 
But there's another aspect that we need to bear in mind that is about the talent. Talent that we have in the country, relatively we are a small country and some of the talent has moved away and has been attracted by by some of the salaries abroad. So under Malaysian Board of Technologies, this is uh, an agency under MOSTI, uh, there's, there's a special uh, sort of plan uh, for us to build agile and computer, uh, competent deep tech uh, talent in the country. This is more of high skill rather than the medium skill because for us to, to make sure that all those technologies that I mentioned earlier on being uh, developed in the country, we need high skill talent. Next, please. Um, instead of the typical pyramid model, what we need is the inverted pyramid model. If we look at the world's uh, top countries for high skilled employers, uh, these are developed nations. Look at Singapore, 54.5% of their skill are high skilled workers, whereas us is the other way around. Uh, we have a heavy bottom, mostly low skill and semi skill but we need to transform. And for us to transform this, there need to be a design. Uh, it has to be by design rather than by chance. Next, please. And in facilitating R&D and startup ecosystem, uh, I've mentioned uh, the, the funding and also what we have at the ministries, uh, agencies, and also department. Uh, this include also MISA, Malaysian uh, Space Agency. Uh, we have our, including our Malaysian, uh, uh, the uh, nuclear agency, sorry, I can't forget that. Malaysian uh, uh, nuclear agency. And these are agencies that support development of technologies. And these are uh, agencies that are also working with startups. So we welcome startup from universities. We know quite a number of, of researchers that came up with uh, products, but uh, probably there are certain things that we need to look at, uh, their TRL. Um, and I hope universities will start looking at the RL of each of their researchers uh, product. Uh, recently, we had one, one university from University of Malaysia Police. There's one researcher that, that came up with uh, graphene that is produced from palm oil. That is, that is game changing to us. So we, we do uh, need that kind of uh, product development and innovation. Next, please. Challenges and way forward, uh, well, as highlighted earlier on, we are still at a level where we were uh, 10 years ago, that is at medium, middle income trap. Uh, we need to move the value chain, uh, moving to experimental development, uh, moving to local technology content, uh, meaning to say, we have to give uh, priority to our local technologies. Uh, our high-tech talent uh, need to be developed and nurtured, and it has to be beyond TRL. It's not about purpose anymore. Uh, if we want to create an ambience where there are 5,000 startups in the country, that is one of the things that we, we think that we should have 5,000 startups in the country, and this will, will create a very competitive ambience and the venture capitalists uh, deserving one to become unicorn. This, how do we do this? Uh, we know there's one that's going to be a unicorn. How do we repeat this? Uh, how do we repeat success stories? Secondly, it's about facilitating innovation-led growth, uh, strong participation from the industry. We need more industries to, to conduct research. Uh, we need to attract quality investment, focusing on creation of high value product rather than, as you know, in, in E and E semiconductor, we are still at the low end of the value uh, product. Uh, and we need to move uh, up, if, uh, even if we are not going to produce seven nanometer uh, chip, but at least if we can go beyond uh, 70 or 50 nanometer. 
Uh, the third one is mismatch of expectation. Uh, this is again TRL, lack of industry demand and R&D, shortage of future and deep tech skill for local talent. Uh, with that, I thank you for your kind attention. Uh, I hope to, to listen to your comments and also your, your suggestion, how can we implement this better? And hopefully as uh, highlighted by World Bank that we should be a developed nation in probably uh, six, seven years uh, time. And yet we need about, according to World Bank, 2 million high skilled workers. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Dr. Hamisa. Uh, listening to the presentation, I think uh, we understand better the big picture of this uh, policy agenda as well as some of the uh, policy details. Now let's uh, hear from uh, our EPU representative, the Central Agency uh, perspective of the theme of this webinar. So, Dr. Belu, the floor is yours. 20 minutes. Thank you, Prof. Uh, let me share my slide. Okay. Um, thank you very much uh, for the UKM for inviting EPU to present the macro uh, perspective of the national fire policy. I'm glad to see uh, most of my friends or people that I know in this MENA. Um, so let us... Uh, venture through what is the national power policy. It's a bit technical um, of the what I'm going to present, but I'll try to keep it as, um, as simple as I can. Um, in the, while we are talking now, let us see, um, uh, let me just make it bigger. Uh, for the 60 seconds, uh, for one minute, so what's happening in the world? So. Uh, this is not new. Uh, people have been talking about it, the exponential of the technologies that's growing and how humans are behaving. So while we are talking for one minute, 28,000 subscribers are watching Netflix. 695,000 uh, stories have been shared in Instagram and goes to the other social media as well. Uh, WhatsApp, you can see 69 million messages have been sent. I think sure. Now, while we are doing the webinar, also people are still seeing messages and all that. So this is the how, what is happening in the world. So we, Malaysia, we can't run away from what's happening so that the impact is with us. So uh, my presentation will, we have four portions. One is the uh, talk about the fourth industrial revolution itself, and then uh, what is the national power policy and why we need that policy, and then how we want to achieve uh, this policy's uh, aspiration. I will go very quickly because of the time limit. So before I start, uh, I think I just saw this video yesterday. I think it's good for me to share this video because to give some, um, uh, what we call some interest in what is the artificial intelligence is one of the technology in fourth industrial revolution. So let me play, it's only 48 seconds. Okay, can see how the uh, the technology of OIR can affect a betterment of human life. This is what we are trying, the message that we are trying to say to the world. Uh, some people fear about the technologies that coming in will take away the human ethics and all that, but there is a good part of it that we can look into it. So uh, what is industrial revolution? So we have first industrial revolution in uh, 
1760s where we people before that we are, have more the uh, cottage industries people live at home and then do the um, uh, agriculture industry, something like that. But once we have the first industrial revolution, people start to go to the factories. And first time, uh, human seeing time, clock, is very becoming very important. The steam power generates more uh, industrial revolution. The second one is the electric power, and the third one is the, the digital revolution, and the fourth one is the fourth industrial revolution. This is what we call uh, fourth industrial revolution. Um, and I just want to give you uh, more in depth on that. Uh, digitalize, digitization, digitalization, and fourth industrial revolution, something different. It's a two, three different things. Digitization is something we take a document and we scan it and make it digital. That is what we call digitization. It's very is in the industrial 3.0. When you have digitalization, is you digitalize the process to make it more productive or more ease to do work. And that is why digitalization. The fourth industrial revolution, it encom encompasses everything. Uh, you must have digital, you must have physical, and you must have biological. The three elements must be there. Then we call it fourth industrial revolution. It must be a disruptive in the nature uh, and, and, uh, and impacts all economic of sector. So uh, Malaysia, we have launched digital economy blueprint in, the, uh, in February. 19 February, and then uh, subsequently, in the 1st July, we launched uh, this uh, fourth industrial revolution uh, for policy. People might ask why we have two different um, blueprint and then a policy is a bit confusing. Of course, in when EPU be tasked to carry out a study and come out a policy for the blueprint and also for the policy, for our policy, we also had the same thought. Uh, we have discussed and discussed, and then we found out, okay, uh, we have to do two different because fourth industrial revolution is very big. It's because it covers many sectors, and uh, digitalization is one part of the fourth industrial revolution. So we actually to give a, a story of it, uh, we want to launch this 4IR and digital economy blueprint together in February. So documents are ready. We want to launch it, but the flavor of the month for the people is digitalization. When the COVID and everything, people are thinking more on digitalization. So we don't want to uh, give more technical, uh, what we call um, problems to the people. We decided we launched the digital economy blueprint first, then we come out with the fourth industrial revolution, maybe two, three months after that. So that's the whole story. Uh, why fourth industrial revolution comes later than digital economy blueprint. So this is the sectors and also the 12 technologies that we identified uh, in uh, uh, what do you call a uh, Malaysia plan. It's the 12 technologies, but this is not carved in the stone. Technologies are changing every day. You have heard more and more slow. So that is what's the, uh, what we call applications that are happening. So why we need these 4R? Uh, because some sectors or many sectors are already using 4R because it will create business opportunities, new value creation, uh, creation, efficiency and productivity, transformation jobs, improved work life and new job creations. So this is what the fourth industrial revolution is doing now. And uh, other countries already have this uh, fourth industrial, industrial revolution policies. Uh, Korea have Korean New Deal, Singapore have Smart Nation, and then Japan have Society 5.0. Uh, we are more inclined to Society 5.0, but a bit different from uh, Society 5.0, our fourth industrial revolution policy. So these are some of the examples of the countries. I will skip this. So in terms of statistics, 83% um, of Malaysians has access to internet, and Malaysians spend nearly eight hours in internet daily. And 71% of Malaysians use smartphones, but in terms of uh, mobile uh, internet penetration, we are under 27%. And nine out of, uh, of 10 Malaysians go online via smartphone. So this is the statistic shows us that the importance of the digitalization and also the COVID-19 pandemic is really boost and uh, wake us up saying that, hey, we, we can't be slow, we have to embark and boost the digitalization process as soon as possible. Uh, just now, 
Datuk Siti Hasan Kamisa have already talked about the Global Innovation Index and also the competitiveness. So where are we? So we need to uh, really boost them up. So uh, why we need the policy? We have to come out a plan to mitigate certain uh, risks that arises from the 4IR. We have job displacement, we have digital divide, societal uh, well-being, ethics and values, and eroding trust in society. And we also want to have um, address existing social environment challenges and grow sustainability because one of the uh, uh, contribution, uh, carbon emission per capita Malaysia contribution is 25% higher than its peers. And also um, documented workers, eh? we are 1.7 million in terms of statistic 2.2.2010 and we have 2.9 million in 2019. People still talking about skill, no low skill foreign workers. And we need digitalization as an answer for it. Nevertheless, by saying that we already use some of the technologies in our process. So firstly, like blockchain technology application for vaccination certificates, we are already using blockchain technology. Uh, data centers, uh, we are inviting uh, companies to come invest to Malaysia and also smart tech. Uh, in the grown, grown, uh, growing grown technologies in the smart farming. So uh, quickly go to the uh, what is the fire policy. So the fire policy we have uh, three uh, overarching policy for three things: so policy coherence, and then to address risk from fire for values and cultures, and create creates conducive ecosystem. How we want to uh, deliver that whole of nation approach? outcome oriented and delivery driven governance structure. So how, what do we intend to achieve by having this fire policy is business growth in all sectors, social environmental well-being for all and fit for future government. So what is the linkage with the uh, digital economy and fire policy? It's very simple by implementing fire, fire policies, you will accelerate the digitalization in Malaysia. This is one word, very simple things. So how we want to achieve, uh, sorry, to achieve by 2030, that is our, our timeline. But it doesn't mean by only 10 years, then only want to achieve it is we have phase by phase. Two years, three years, five years. So for quality of life, Malaysia Wellbeing Index, we want to achieve 236.5. We want longer and healthier lifespan for Malaysia, safer and secure living, meaningful use of time. In terms of local capabilities um, for the industries, we want top 20 in Global Innovation Index, 30% productivity increase in all sectors, more higher paid jobs, fit for future education and talent, 3.5% GERD, including for 4 related R&D. Now, currently, we are only 1.04% GERD in R&D. It's very low. And then more homegrown fire technology providers and more efficient government services. In ecological integrity, we want top 50 in environmental performance index and reduce uh, green uh, greenhouse gas emissions intensity by 45% by 2030. So how do we achieve the aspiration of this national fire policy? We have nice policies, but uh, how we want to achieve it? Uh, this the slide that I want to um, get some attention from the participant because we can see here is our when we uh, we ask to do this policy when we think about it for the Malaysian's lifestyle what is the best how we want to start the the policy planning uh, which angle we want to look at it so that's why just now I mentioned about Japan's society 5.0 so this is this is more or less a same approach we are using. Uh, we take human-centric approach. That means uh, we don't see the technologies, what are technologies available, then we apply it to the what behavior, we change to the behavior to the technologies. We said no. Our policy should be what behavior, a culture or social values that we want to uh, 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 create for the Malaysian society, and we develop the technology accordingly. So this is what we have uh, we have uh, taken uh, 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 what we call a leading example. Um, it's analogy I can give you. Let's say we want road drivers 
what type of behavior for our drivers we want to have. So we need to have a technologies to 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 suit that behavior what we want to change. Let's say we have a sensor technologies. We see the people are respecting the traffic lights or they are uh, not uh, respecting the uh, speed limits or how they drive. So these are things data can be uh, given to the authorities or to the insurance companies and uh, we can see the changes of the behavior. So this is what uh, this slide is all about, human-centric approach of the fire policy. And uh, we have 16 strategies, 32 national initiatives that cover businesses, society, and public sector. And we have 10 sector focus that we have said, uh, not only national, we need to focus on the sectors as well. So manufacturing, of course, manufacturing, we, they have already have industry 4.0 or industry forward, transportation, healthcare, until tourism. So these are the sectors that we, uh, there is initiative, specific initiatives for these sectors. And uh, five technological uh, foundation that we have identified also is artificial intelligence, IoT, blockchain, big data, and also advanced maintenance. Because big data is quite very important. Uh, this is not new, but it's been used very much earlier in 70s, 80s or so, data mining. When uh, we go to supermarket or hypermarket, you always can see uh, when you buying some, some uh, groceries or some uh, clothes, you can see some like uh, drivers or milks will be there. It's actually it's data mining to see that, to say that, oh, we have found that people are buying clothes they will also buying this kind of thing. So this is what we call data mining in those days. Now we have this big data analytics because data is very much uh, abundant in Malaysia and also the world because that you never take the data and analyze it, then we are in the losing end. So these are the uh, strategies that I said about the 10 sectors. We have 64, 60, sorry, 60 strategies talking about all sectors. And uh, this is the council that um, chaired by Prime Minister. In order to come up with this council, it's not just we take another council. So Malaysia knows we have a lot of uh, bureaucratic kind of things. We have another committees and nothing though. No, this is not like that. We have come up with this council. We have uh, abolished few committees chaired by the Prime Minister or other ministers which is much more relevant to this council and also subsume some committees under this uh, council. So that means these councils have taken the job or task of many committees to come out of this uh, National Digital Economy and Fire Council, where we have ministers. We have uh, industries to be there because we don't want this champion by the government only. We have included uh, private sector representatives and also academicians and CSOs. We have six classes, digital talent, digital infra, emerging technologies, economy, society, and government. And we have three, um, we call it uh, three uh, cut across kind of um, um, initiatives that we need to really look at it. At it is agile regulation, cyber security, and also inclusivity and sustainability. And we have a strategy change management office. We have newly established that in EPU to really look into the uh, how to make sure that all the initiatives that have been uh, drawn out can be carried out effectively. So just uh, I want to bring focus on the SMEs. Uh, I'm not saying other mid-tier or the large companies are not important, but you see the SMEs plays an important role in the Malaysian, uh, Malaysian economy. Uh, by the data, we can see SMEs recorded 1.5 million establishment uh, is 97.2% from the total establishments. So it's really a backbone of these things. And, um, and we have, uh, apart from 97.2% from there, 85% is in the services sector. And we you dissect the services sector or the SMEs, you can see 70% of them 
is very much traditional. So whatever we say about digitalization for industrial revolution, you need to boost them. The thinking or the, 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 the ability to adapt that is a, a bit low. Because if I give an example in services, you can, the food truck also is part of the SMEs. We call it micro, micro SMEs. When you, they are there, when you want to talk about digitalization, you go and talk to, hey, he is doing food truck businesses, selling uh, what you call uh, roja or anything. You go and tell them, okay, you have to digitalize your businesses. He will say, no, what for? I'm already happy with what I'm having now. You don't come and disturb me now. So this is that we have to dissect and segmentize the SMEs. Uh, many people out there will talk about SMEs not ready. Uh, we are not doing uh, good enough, but they fail to understand the structure of our SMEs. Uh, nevertheless, government is not um, losing hope. So I just give you some... Yeah. So we for the uh, for for very current uh, for package that the stimulus packages that announced by the government or prime ministers, you can see twenty billion have been allocated for digitalization for uh, our establishments. Twenty billion. It's not a small amount from last year until now, and the the, the figures is going up again. And for the uh, budget every year, yearly for last this year, 2021, 2.6 billion been allocated for the programs and projects for the digitalization for uh, for all establishment, uh, not only SMEs. And for the RMK 11, the long-term five-year plans for Malaysia, we have allocated for R&D and CNI is 4 billion. But the problem that, uh, uh, we in EPU or when we are doing uh, some analysis and see, we have found that even though we are we are giving fund to the uh, ministries and also agencies, the private sectors take up uh, is 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 uh, overwhelming. But the problem for I'm talking about the RD and CNI, uh, particularly the uh, the quality of the research that we are getting is not up to the standard, up to the mark that what we want for the, the, the vision of the country. Um, to give an example, uh, for this year, for RDNCI, we only have, we have some, some fund that we given to the MOSTI and we have about 30% been, been taken up. But we see the, the quality of the, the, um, the, research that we are getting is not what we wanted. And uh, rightly pointed out by the KSU that we have uh, only asked, already asked all ministries who are doing research to make sure that 50% of the R&D that we are giving fund, funded by the government must be experimental research. So this is what uh, com uh, government have committed. And, and just, I just want to give the uh, example of this um, Usain Bolt and Usain Bolt has won now is Olympic already closed now. Usain Bolt has won eight gold medals in three Olympics. He have only run less than two minutes. But for that particular two minutes, he can won three Olympics. He have invested 20 years of plus training. So uh, for our SMEs or our establishment to boost the digitalization, so we need to do now and earlier. We have done it before, but we have to really boost them to go. People ask why we are now in COVID. We are now uh, problems. We, are, we have problems put to put, put the foot on the table. Now we are coming up policy of 4R, we are coming up policy of digital, what for? Give me money, give me incentive. That's one part we are doing, but another part is the investment. When the, you, see, you have, I think most of the uh, participants have heard the long COVID is that the COVID, the impact of the COVID will be there. So how we want to survive and the, the technological impact, the wave is coming. So you must have the plan. So this is what the 4 plan is, is the investment that we're going to do. 
Um, I just want to give you the, for these are the sum of the financial initiative that uh, government have given uh, to the industries. So to the mosties that uh, we have given fund So I'm just going back for this the latest study by the uh, World Economic Forum and also the statist, uh, under the uh, statista. So we found that the 76% of Malaysian is, is not worried about anything, is they worried about coronavirus. And uh, this is a very important slide because uh, I was thinking if 10 years before, 10 years back, we got the coronavirus pandemic, what will happen to the, to the world and to the Malaysian? We don't have much more technologies those days. Now we have at least the four industrial revolution, digitalization. We can respond nicely to the uh, COVID pandemic. Then we, uh, because the mRNA is new technologies uh, that coming up based on the fourth industrial revolution technologies. Uh, last, my last slide is this about this um, the ethics or the attitudes that we have to do to uh, talk about creators. We need to have more creators, local champions in the technological uh, arena. So last, I think many people remember this uh, slide, or this um, prototype of the, the uh, air mobility. Uh, this is designed by one of the local company, Aerodyne, 2019. People laugh about it and then we talk. Uh, more a lot of things that negatively about this uh, so-called flying car, lah. but we in terms of industry we call it air mobility. Uh, this is the Airbus latest Airbus 2021 and successful, successful prototype and is have been taken up and it was one hour I think on the air. It's very similar, but when we produce this, we have been teased. And we never accepted that Malaysia can do. But these Airbus have done it. So what, this is what I'm trying to say is we, we our Malaysians are have capable. Aerodyne is not a, a, a simple or normal company. They are number two or number three in the world in terms of drone facilities. And they're doing successfully in other countries in the world. But Malaysia is the attitude. We have to change a bit. So uh, some of the companies, I know there are many companies outside there. But some of the companies that I would like to just share, the Sky Chip is one of the companies that uh, uh, we established last year under the government funding, and we really pushed for it, the company. And with their own talent, now they can produce these, uh, what we call um, the IC design, the same link as Google or Intel, six to seven nanometers now. They are the same level. It's not... It's not a small achievement. It's a big achievement that nation companies they are then they have a good demand from the China. And I talk about Aerodyne, Dream Age is one of the companies they have R and D center for uh, 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 what you call automotive in Japan. Our local nation boys doing there. And Vitrox is one of the companies and many knows about Vitrox. And Kasim we talk about is going towards the unicorn and UMW is is. The, when we go to, uh, you, you bought the flight, you can see the, uh, what we call the uh, blades, engine blades. Eh? The fan casing is designed and is, is was done in UMW, Malaysia. Serdang. Uh, see this, Serda, sorry, Serenda. This is where is Malaysian companies have done it. And then we must be is proud of um, things that we we have designed and then we that is nation made the fan casing eh? and this uh, rnh is actually people have seen the um, pie the life of pie the animation of the tiger bengal tiger is actually designed and animated by RNH, local companies so there are many companies malaysians uh, capable of doing this so now it's time for uh, us to really push these companies these kind of companies to come out and then we challenge them to come out. That's what the next presenter will talk about, the startups and everything. We want these things to happen. So in RMK12 uh, and onwards, there are many strategies and vision that we have put it in to make sure we are in the line of uh, Malaysia going for high-tech nations. With that, I conclude my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Velo. 
Very interesting presentation, a lot of details there. I'm sure a lot of follow-ups needs to be done. That's even more important. Yeah. Uh, now let's move into the in the interest of time. Let's move to the next uh, panelist, um, Madam Rafiza. Thank you to very share, much. Uh, perspective. Yeah, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, bis uh, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and good morning. Uh, first of all, thank you very much uh, for giving me this opportunity. Um, wait, sorry. Who? Yeah, there's a little bit of a technical thing. Um, who's sharing my screen, please? Okay, thank you very much. In the interest of time, uh, I'll just go through this uh, very, very quickly. Um, and uh, a lot of the things um, I will tell you where the source is. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm quite cognizant the fact that, you know, I'm the last speaker. So, you know, the last speaker is always under pressure to make sure, you know, we keep up to the standard to the other two esteemed speakers uh, and also, uh, you know, optimize uh, whatever remaining minutes that I have. So uh, the whole presentation, I'm going to, put through in three parts. Uh, and this is uh, have been requested uh, from the host on the three areas that uh, I, I talked quickly about. Some area which have been uh, mentioned by Dr. KSU and Dr. Value, uh, I'm not going to uh, go through in that. Uh, they are a lot more um, you know, knowledgeable to talk about it. But I just put it in here so that it gives a context to my flow of presentation. Next. Next. Okay, uh, this is the timeline. As you know, it starts 2021, uh, 2030 on the Malaysia Digital Economy Blueprint. Uh, the reason why I wanted to share this very quickly because it gives a context on the different phases, you know, throughout the 10-year uh, plan and, and how, you know, uh, a lot of the other agencies and, you know, the likes of us, uh, Cradle. Uh, Cradle, as you know, uh, we are under Ministry of Science Technology in supporting, you know, the government to execute this plan. Next. Uh, this is uh, in Malaysia Digital uh, Economy Blueprint, the key thrusts and strategies. Next. So uh, this is not exhaustive. I think the slides that provided Dato Value in uh, Dato Valu gives a lot more uh, details on all the various incentives uh, for uh, digitalization, uh, our digitalization journey. Um, so there's there's a number of you know grants, especially targeted to you know the SMEs, corporate startups, uh, even individual uh, micro SMEs, you know, to accelerate the digitalization and you know embark on the digital journey. Uh, so more information uh, can be found at their their website. Um, MPC as well under industry forward grant. But what uh, the reason why I want to share this is that, you know, when I, uh, you know, they're not just giving money, but, you know, especially like MDEC and MPC, they also provide uh, coaching and uh, consultation on how, especially the SMEs, you know, holding hands on how they can um, embark on their digital journey. So that's very, very important, like, because, you know, it's not just about the giving money, but uh, advisory and consultation. Next slide, please. Uh, under the Penjana, there's also uh, a number of uh, initiatives uh, to support uh, the two blueprint. But what I want to share, this uh, initiative so announced prior to the blueprint uh, were launched. So obviously, you know, what we see uh, here uh, today is, like I said, it's not exhaustive. Uh, exhaustive. There's a, a lot of other initiatives on the digital, and I suspect, you know, uh, a lot of the other agencies as well and the government ministries are working towards, you know, uh, and preparing uh, for the remaining RMK 12, you know, under the Blanja 1 2022. Next. Uh, as mentioned by Dr. KSU earlier, uh, Malaysia Grand Challenge, uh, uh, five funds uh, to support uh, technology, uh, you know, uh, research, development and commercialization uh, and innovation. 
uh, you can uh, uh, get more information on, I provide the website down there, idanamustigovernment.gov.my. Uh, and there's an allocation of 230 million uh, to support and applications open to startup companies, SMEs, multinational companies and individuals. Next. Uh, as mentioned again uh, by Datuk KSU under the Net National Technology Innovation uh, Sandbox that's spearheaded by the Ministry of Science, Technology and Innovation. So this is also a grant uh, and support, not just grant, but support available for you know uh, the local technology uh, companies to really uh, develop and uh, commercialize uh, their technology. So some examples are robotics, blockchain, uh, neurotechnology, 5G. And these are you know the areas... Uh, uh, that is uh, has been provided by uh, Dato KSU earlier under the my, uh, 10 by 10 uh, my STIE and also I've also provided that document uh, in the chat uh, as well. Yeah, next. So under uh, Cradle, uh, we have two programs, uh, CIP Ignite, uh, CIP Accelerate. CIP Ignite, uh, it's a conditional grant and value-added services up to half a million ringgit for tech startups, local SMEs, and spin-off companies from universities and research institutes. So under Ignite, we have two, uh, and they both cater different TRL. I'll show you later. Uh, so, and under CIP Accelerated, uh, Accelerate, it's a, pro, a grant uh, of funding of up to 2 million and value added assistance that uh, caters to deep tech startups, uh, SMEs, or spin off companies from universities and research institutes. Next. Um, again, uh, so this is uh, sort of also part repetition of our, uh, the earlier slides by Dato KSU, but we put it in a different way. So these are all the various uh, funding agencies uh, that is made available. Uh, so it starts from R&D all the way to extension. And I've color coded it to differentiate between grant and mainly grant. So Cradle, uh, we provide uh, grant. Uh, we do have uh, some investment as well, but our focus Focus, I would say probably our ninety percent focus is on a create uh, is on the grant side. So as you can see, it starts from pre seed and seed, and this is where, like what uh, Dato Value mentioned earlier, uh, this is where you know uh, the the government needs to provide uh, some support and intervention because this is the area where it's very uh, un, you know it's unlikely that the technologies can get private money on this, and this is where you know Cradle uh, brings in, and then we also have MTD that uh, looks at a uh, uh, much later stage. And then we also have uh, some investment uh, that's uh, Cradles Adventures, MathCap, and Kumpulan Modal Perdana. And then uh, lastly, we have the Venture Debt. Um, you know, but that's more towards uh, a more growth and advanced uh, technology uh, funding. Next. Next. I'm just, uh, okay, next. So this is a little bit of a history of Cradle. So we started off from 2003. We have funded uh, more than 1,000 early stage uh, technology startups. Some of our notable names um, is Grab. So we provided two grants to Grab, uh, CIP Catalyst and CIP 500. Uh, that's when they were my taxi. And uh, there's other, you know, like um, uh, Super Hands, uh, Droppy, the lorry, you know, some of the startups, uh, up and coming startups uh, that we provide funding for. And we don't just provide funding, we also um, work with the founders very closely. And, you know, through uh, when we provide funding, we provide them over a period of between 16 months to 18 months. And they, it's according to deliverables. So they need to achieve their milestones. The reason why we do this rather than provide it upfront funding uh, to the founders is it gives us an opportunity for us to work very closely together. So we provide coaching and mentoring. And what we have found, uh, you know, this also helps with commercialization of, um, you know, of, uh, of uh, the, the startups. So it's it's a journey with them, and you know, and that's where we feel that that's the value that uh, Cradle brings in really developing and uh, creating uh, this uh, successful startups. Next. 
So the first one is Ignite. I'm just going to go through very, very quickly just to give you uh, everyone a little bit of a flavor, but I will also provide you uh, information on the link on where you can find this information in a lot more detail. And of course, you know, if need be, you know, uh, you know, I would be more than happy for Cradle to have a more detailed uh, session with you. We had one with UKM uh, before, so we'd be more than happy to have a, 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 a lot, you know, a bit more uh, detailed session to go through, especially our eligibility criteria. What are the things that we look at? You know, I think that will help a lot of the researchers, uh, especially for in the universities and research institutes to see how, you know, to increase the success rate of this application. And uh, like what Dr. Value said, you know, uh, perhaps, you know, share with you, what are the things that we look at? Uh, and, and as mentioned by Dr. KSU, uh, because this is government uh, funding, uh, so we need to look for really game-changing technology. Uh, technology that probably takes a little bit longer for gestation period. And this is why, you know, uh, this is the area where you need the money from the government because things are that very fast, you know, current, uh, 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 you know, a, a more straightforward digital platform that can make money immediately. Those, we tend to leave it to the private sectors to look into it because, you know, there's a commercial value. But things that are a lot more, you know, that requires a little bit more clarity, a little a bit longer period to show the commercial value. And this is where, you know, uh, the government feel that, you know, this is where we can support. So as you can see under uh, Ignite, we have Ignite One, uh, which is for deep tech startups, and that's a TRL between five to seven. And then we have uh, tech-based startups. So these are not deep tech, which is, you know, the traditional type of startups that Cradle used to fund. Uh, so even though the focus is on deep tech, but we also allow some allocation uh, to be provided to uh you know, non-deep tech-based uh, startups. But uh, they are all uh, technology startups. And like I said, it's not just about technology, uh, but how different your technology is. Like, for example, we have, uh, i just give you an example. So we've had like about maybe more than nine or ten uh, type of ed tech startups that come to us tuition platform, platform for teachers and students, and et cetera, et cetera. There's loads and loads of that. But recently, one came to us, you know, that embedded artificial intelligence. So in, you know, if not because of that, we would probably not look at it because we feel that, you know, it's saturated and there's a lot of players out there. But, you know, the, the last startups that we, you know, that we approve uh, sort of, it, because it embedded an AI, so it makes it like, you know, the matching between the students and the teachers, you know, a lot more faster compared to the traditional, uh, you know, ed tech platform. So that's, that's an example that, you know, we look for. So um, because we have... Our success rate uh, is between six to seven percent. So we get like more than hundred applications, and a lot of the times uh, we see sort of the same type of uh, startups or you know technology that come to us. Uh, so because our funding is uh, allocation is very, you know, uh, it's not a lot. So we have to prioritize to fund something which is like what Dato Kes, you mentioned, game changing, very different and one that we feel uh, would be able to survive, uh, you know, the valley of death and get further funding by private VCs. Next. So uh, again, a lot of this, I'm not going to go through in detail. They are all in our website, which I will provide you with the link later. Next. I'm sure a lot of you knows what deep tech is. Um, okay, uh, this is very, very broad uh, eligibility criteria. It has to be Sandra Amber Hart. Um, you know, accumulated revenue of not more than 5 million, as you know, um, because our focus is on the early uh, stage of the venture. So later stage, we have our sister agencies that look into it. So that's earlier earlier slides that I showed you where we are and hence why we put a cap on the uh, accumulated revenue because we believe that, you know, once you have achieved more than that revenue, there's a lot more, um, you know, uh, parties that you can approach with funding for. Um, and, and it has to be sort of a, a Sina Brahat. It's not part of a much bigger company. 
a minimum paid up capital of 10,000 and, you know, 51% Malaysian own, uh, etc. But what's important is that that applicant must have the IP rights. So a lot of the times when, you know, sometimes when applicants comes to us, like, you know, they don't have the IP rights or they don't have some sort of a, a, a licensing agreement to be able to access that IP. So that part is very important. Next. Uh, technology drivers, this is very much aligned to my STIE. And what's interesting is that even though we came up with this uh, SOP prior to uh, my digital blueprint and also the national for IR policy, uh, you know, we're very happy that, you know, it actually supports. And what we're going to do is like for, you know, future grants, we make sure that the alignment is even closer. Next. Um, so, uh, our, you know, the funding that we provide, uh, for example, Ignite 1 and Ignite 2, 80% developmental expenses, 20% non-developmental expenses. This is very important. We need to make sure that the money that, you know, that the government provides uh, goes to spend uh, the right thing. So, you know, for example, we don't allow for the money to be paid to, you know, SEO salary or whatever. But if you want to pay the salary of the technical person, the R&D person, yes, that's allowed, you know. Uh, so things like, for example, much uh, like uh, normal rental or whatever, we also limit so that we make sure that, you know, uh, our, our funding is very, very focused and optimized. Next. Uh, give an example of what are developmental and what are commercial. So again, a lot of this information is in the website. I'm not going to go through in detail. Next. Accelerate. Uh, next. Uh, accelerate. Uh, looks at uh, commercialization of a proven system and ready products. So this looks at between TRL 8 and 9. Uh, the way how it's designed, uh, some of our applicants, they will go through uh, Ignite 1 first, which looks at TRL 5 to 7 for deep back. And then once um, it's proven, then they can come to us with the 2 million. So that's how sometimes our startups, that's what we make sure that, you know, uh, there is a, a very good flow uh, throughout the supply chain. And uh, not only that, uh, what we do, because we are on the early stage, we also need to make sure that we are the best party to provide the deal flow to our other sister agencies, you know, to, to scale up their technology further. Uh, so this is sort of, you know, I would call it the first stage of the stage gate, you know, and then, um, and this is where we believe that Cradle can play a big role to support, you know, both Blueprint, especially the one that Datuk mentioned in creating new 5,000 startups, because, you know, the early stage come to us, uh, we provide all the coaching and the funding to make sure that their business model is very strong and robust before we pass over to the other uh, sister agency to further scale up, you know, the technology. Thanks. Next. Again, very similar uh, to uh, Ignite earlier. Uh, next. Again, uh, similar. I'm not going to go through. Next. Uh, for CIP Accelerate, we allow 60% of the funding goes to commercialization expenses and 40% to non-commercialization expenses. Next. Um, what's allowable expenses? So these are, you know, some of the things. Um, next. Yes. Okay. So, um, a lot of people, I saw someone wrote in the question earlier that, you know, uh, as a funding agency, we need to make sure how best we can, you know, the process of uh, approval uh, should be less bureaucratic and everything. I completely agree with you. Uh, but on the other hand, because it's this government's money, we need to make sure that we also look and we, we need to make sure that the governance aspect uh, is met as well. So it's not like, you know, it's not like it's my own personal money. Someone come to me and I can't make a decision. So we need to make sure that we, you know, adhere to a, a minimum standard of governance. And uh, because like I said, this is right, yeah, it's money uh, that we look after. So normally from the time that the applicant comes in to us and make submissions uh, to the part to the point where we uh, approve uh, it takes between 8 to 12 months now the reason why it takes a little bit longer because as you know some of this uh, technology 
technology is very, very niche. They are innovative. They are not off the shelf uh, technology. So we need a little bit more time, you know, and get experts advice on really the future of some of these technologies. So that's why sometimes it takes a long time. And plus, um, what we found majority of the applicants that come to us, they probably only come with 90% or 80% uh, of the information that we require. So this allows as well, um, you know, um, various consultations, um, and there's also uh, pitching sessions, uh, shortlisted sessions. Uh, and what my team also does is that what we found, because these are early stage startups, they're not, you know, um, big corporate established, um, you know, um, staff. So they may some, I'm not saying all, we've seen some really, really um, amazing startup founders, you know, they are ex-corporate, ex-government, ex, um, you know, consultants that come to us. So those, you know, we don't, you know, we don't, prov we, we, we're not so worried about, but uh, because of the concept of inclusivity that we need to make sure that, you know, this is made available to everyone. Uh, so there are some founders that come to us that will probably require a little bit of a coaching so that by the time it comes for them to uh, pitch their idea to the approving committee, they are also ready because, you know, these are really smart founders, you know, they're, they're very visionary, they're very innovative, but perhaps they probably need a little bit of help, yeah, especially because we only allow 10 minutes for them to pitch. So, you know, our team will spend time practicing with them. So that's why sometimes it takes a long time. Of course, we would love, uh, you know, to do it as, as soon as, uh, you know, as fast as possible, but we can't shortcut uh, especially when, you know, we need to identify really, really game-changing technology and we need to be fair as well to all applicants. So we don't reject uh, immediately if they meet eligibility criteria. We spend uh, quite some time with them to really understand what the technology is about. Sometimes uh, it's not, um, you know, immediate uh, that they share with us, okay, this is very different. But after a number of a couple of rounds of pitching sessions, then that's where we realize, oh wow, this is really game changing. So we we need have to have that time as well. Thanks. Next. Again, uh, so any of you uh, who wants to uh, inquire us more, uh, please drop us an email or you can look into our website. If you're ready to apply for CIP Ignite, uh, we have a grant management system. So everything's being done online, even our pitching session, you know, everything is done online, KSU and uh, Datuk Valuvan. Um, so where Cradle said is that, you know, we're very honoured uh, Cradle to be a member of the uh, under the emerging technology that's also chaired uh, by our minister, and uh, the way how we execute is that you know from this two blueprint, then we can and and it is also timely because all of the agencies are already starting uh, their planning process uh, for uh, the year 2022. And we've also been working very closely with MOF uh, to, you know, uh, provide suggestions on, you know, what we can ask for to support this execution, um, you know, under the Blanja 1 2022. So, so that's how we execute. And, um, you know, when, when these two blueprint came out, one in February, in one in one in July, we you know one of the first few things that we do. Okay, how 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 is it aligned, and how we can prioritize our resources? You know our uh, uh, our resources, both financially and uh, non financial resources, to really support the execution. So I believe you know new incentives and new initiatives will be announced by all the various agencies that's involved in the execution. And this is where, you know, uh, Cradle can work very closely uh, to support uh, the implementation of these two most uh, two, two blueprints. And just to share with you, because this is hosted by UKM, um, next slide, please. So Cradle, uh, for the last 
uh, for this year, we uh, have been, you know, quite aggressively uh, having sessions, engagement sessions with all the various universities. So we had one at UKM. Uh, there's only one that we did physically because that was prior to the lockdown with University of Malaya. But the rest of it, uh, but the rest, you know, we were, you know, very uh, happy to be able to have the sessions, um, you know, online. Uh, so that has been very, very helpful. Uh, and it is our on you know um, our pleasure to work very closely with the university fraternity, especially with the researchers, to see how we can you know make sure that you know whatever that you work uh, hard for actually being used out there and you know really uh, making uh, you know uh, changing lives uh, to the people. So I think with that uh, I end my presentation and I look forward to answer as many questions and uh, clarification uh, that you uh, put, uh, put up to me. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Rafiza. Very interesting presentation. A lot of information there. Uh, I'm sure it is very useful to the industries that are with us today. Uh, certainly uh, later, a lot of follow-ups you should expect. Um, in the interest of time, uh, we should actually end this session by 12. Uh, so it looks like not much time left for Q&A. But anyway, I want to still entertain a couple of uh, questions. Of course, our earlier plan, we thought to have a second round of, of, of you know, uh, this session, uh, but we have to do away with that. Anyway, uh, judging from all the presentations made, I think we have enough uh, information about the big picture as well as the death and the breadth of the policy interventions on the part of government. So perhaps maybe we, we should uh, listen to the questions that uh, our audience uh, have, and let's see whether we can uh, entertain uh, one or two before we conclude. So I hope the secretary ready with... Uh, oh, Mr. Kellen raised his hand. I want to give the floor to Mr. Kellen, if you would like to ask. Yes, Mr. Kellen. I can't hear you. Please unmute. I can't hear you. You, you. Please unmute, Mr. Kellen. Uh, I'm still waiting. <laughs> no, we can't hear you. Uh, it looks like uh, Mr. Kellen having a uh, problem. Okay. Okay. I mean, because you need to unmute me first. Okay. Uh, All right. Right. Okay. You, mm. Professor, I'm sorry. Uh, mm. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Siti Hamiza. Apa khabar lama dah jumpa. Dr. Walu and also Pan Raviza. Very good, comprehensive thing. Dr. Walu, I need to ask you this question, which I've asked before during our meeting. For the benefit of people who are listening, today I wear two hats, one as the Honorary President of MPMA, the other one as the President of the Malaysian Consortium of Mid-Tier Companies. Mid-Tier Companies form only 1.7%, less than 2% of all companies in Malaysia. Okay, we employ 16%, one six, uh, of total labor force, down from 22% in 2016. And the reason is because many of these mid-tier companies have gone into automation. But this 1.7% of the companies contribute to 39.9% of our country's GDP. Uh, so Dr. Walu, what you said just now, I agree very fully with you. We take the case of the Roger seller in the food truck. You talk to them about industry 4.0, you say, thank you, but it does not interest me because I don't need that. So at the end of the day, we have the reality on the ground zero is that it is the hierarchy of needs. If my company don't need that, if I'm only an SME, you know, don't talk to me about 4.0 because my priority, uh, Professor, is to get the business, get the production going, deliver the goods, collect money and live another day. I also want to stress that most 
if not all mid-tier companies, my included, but one's SME. So we know what are the pains like and what are the, the challenges. But these mid-tier companies, which are mainly formerly SMEs, are companies who have gone through, a, weathered a lot of storms, gone through several crises and came out stronger and wiser. Then the reality that Tupalu is that it will be the mid-tier companies, the bigger, medium-sized SMEs, and the more progressive, small companies who will adopt Industry 4.0. Uh, and again, people will do it when they are ready. Otherwise, if we keep promoting like that, it's good. But they say, this is not what I want. So my point is, why don't we then focus on the mid-tier companies, give them more incentive, and then when the mid-tier grows, you see, multinational corporations, it's not that they don't want to support SMEs. If I'm an MNC, I want to give the job to SME, I look at it, they don't have the ISO certification, number one. Number two, they do not have the necessary compliances to meet all the requirements of my big customers overseas. Number three, they may not have the talents, the hardware and the software. However, when they give all these orders to the mid-tier companies who have all these uh, requirements, then when the mid-tier company gets the job, they do not work in isolation. They will then give the, the other job, the packaging, the carton, the tape, the stickers, and all the other parts and components to the SME and to supply them. So the whole supply chain is taken care of. And when the MNC grows, mid-tier grows, the SME grows. And then we do hand-holding. One of the objectives of the mid-tier uh, Malaysian consortium of mid-tier companies is to help the small become medium, medium become mid-tier companies, and the mid-tier becomes MNC. So this is where we want to look at uh, how we can drive it together. So Dr. Balu, I hope that you all will give more incentive. Uh, one of the other things which I presented to Tan Sri uh, Professor Noor Aslan, uh, the executive director of EAC recently, and also to the board of trustees of MIER, was that uh, the smart automation grants, the government started with 100 million, and this is strictly for automation only on a one-to-one -one grants basis. When, because through my dad, and the response is so good, they increased another 50 million. You know, so that 50, 150 million, apparently now, quota all used up. So my point, uh, Professor, is that if this is selling so well, let's say we have a restaurant, we have many items on the menu, but a few items are the best sellers. I think we should focus on this. And you see, I'm thinking of increasing, you know, the allocation from 1 million per company, 1 million ringgit per company to maybe 2 million. And if you go to 300 companies, there's 600 million. One to one, it becomes 1.2 billion. But of course, not every company will use the 2 million. Many more companies can, can, can enjoy from that. So when you look at it, uh, it's 1.2 billion strictly on automation. My company invested in that. Uh, my output, my headcount, uh, headcount went down by 80% for packaging. Uh, but my output went down by 300%. So it's a lot of return on investment, even though it's really And I think there's something we can look at. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, <laughs> Mr. Caleb. Maybe we should have him also uh, as a panel next time <laughs> uh, to talk more about from industry perspective. Now, uh, Dr. Anissa has to leave early for post-cap. Uh, apparently, the minister is calling uh, early uh, post-cap meeting today. But I would like to invite uh, our panelists here, Dr. Belu and uh, Ms. Raveza, to perhaps uh, respond quickly to what has been said by Mr. Caleb. Dr. Belu? Uh, Dr. Raveza, are you still here? I, I saw that uh, the city Amisa want to say something. Uh, yeah, please, please. Uh, or, uh, I'll just take a minute. Uh, it's quite an interesting uh, proposal from Mr. Callum, by Mr. Callum. Yes, uh, I concur with you. We need to we need to have the 
medium tier to go up to the next level as much as we need to work on the startup as presented by Puan uh, Rafiza today. The of global business and, and digital we, economy we, was established on June 1st, 2018. Our strong research How can we escalate or how can we scale up these companies? Global business and competitiveness. We rely on the most national companies for the time. Technology and big data. Cluster three, global competency and innovation. Cluster four, global financial analytics and financialization. Together, our clusters generate advanced emerging technologies. Develop and drive best practices in global business and the digital economy. Provide positive impact on future policy. Nurture talent, researchers, and geocentric leaders. Driving a better okay. future for the global. A little bit of uh, disturbance uh, in the background. I don't know where it comes from. But anyway, uh, I'm sorry, are you still there? Okay, I think uh, we heard uh, the earlier part of her uh, response. Uh, I don't know whether Dr. Bailey want to add a uh, little bit more. Yeah, yeah. Uh, to, uh, thank you, Mr. Kalam, for the uh, uh, the insight of what media companies can help on the digitalization of the SMEs. Uh, nevertheless, I don't say no. That is what we, we intend to do. Uh, as I said in my presentation as well, we, we need to segmentize the SMEs and also the establishments. Uh, how we can expedite or accelerate the digitalization because uh, it doesn't fit for all. When you talk about the SMEs, micros or mid-tier companies, uh, mid-tier companies, of course, they have the capabilities and abilities to do so, but on the SMEs, they are not that, uh, what we call uh, in that, uh, platform to embrace the technologies, but uh, we have to segmentize and then see where are they, and we have to look in the vertical form uh, of the supply chain where we want to digitalize, so what kind of technology they want to use, and apart from the digitalization, 4 is not only on digital, but it's only uh, for the other things. Remember I said about the uh, biological and also the physical things, there are other technologies. We want SMEs one thing they digitalize, another thing is they can be the innovative or innovator of the technologies uh, of the other things. This is what we want to uh, promote. So uh, first thing, yes, we need to see which are the SMEs or mid tier companies that we can uh, uh, segmentize them and then boost the digitalization. Of course, mid tier is one of the priorities for us. The second one is we want to create more innovations from our local companies. These two things very quickly. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, you can join host that for that. Uh, sure. Yeah, Madam Rafiza, you want to say something? Yes, um, of, through what to what Mr. Callum uh, mentioned earlier. So just to share with you, uh, at Cradle Fund, we support uh, indirectly because some of our startups actually also serve uh, the mid-tier companies. Uh, give you an example. Uh, we have some logistics startups uh, that allow for, you know, like what you said, they, digitalization may not be their priority, but at least it helps, you know, the media companies to uh, continue to have access uh, during uh, to their customers during MCO. Uh, that's one example. So we have some startups that also uh, support with regards to uh, invoice factoring, supply chain, um, you know, to, to assist because we we we, we know uh, during the lockdown and pandemic you know they uh, and and we see that in some of our startups as well it's not so much about they they don't have business they have the business but they can't execute that business you know they can't deliver to their customers they can't actually uh, you know because of the rules that they have to play you know so indirectly this is we support our startups so that they can uh, you know support uh, the mid tier companies with their business thanks Oh, thank you. Very happy to hear that. Yeah, <laughs> Madam Rafiza. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you very much. It looks like that's all the time that we have <laughs> for today's session. Uh, it suggests that maybe we need to have another session. We'll be focusing on uh, mid-tier. So I'm more than happy to, you know, to work again with Mr. Callum and uh, the yeah, rest of the panelists yeah. uh, to, to address uh, those concerns. Um, yes, uh, before ending, one thing, I saw the one question saying that uh, what happened to Industry 4.0? Uh, 
we launched by Miti. Okay. Uh, just very quick one, industry 4.0 is still active and live. No, no need to worry because fourth industrial revolution covers a lot of other sectors. Industry 4.0 covers only manufacturing and manufacturing related services. So this are subsumed the fourth industry forward under them. So when I say the slides, we got 10 sectors, manufacturing is one of them. The industry forward is still there. So no need to worry. Thank you. Uh, Dato Balu, All right. for those who, sorry, just for the info, uh, MPC is organizing a WebEx on Zoom meeting on Industry 4.0, and I'm one of the speakers. I'm also getting data in to talk about the Industry industry Forward grants, because there's no point talking about Industry Forward, and people say, yeah, Kela, I'm so, but where can I get help? Uh, this is something I'm, I'm continuing to work on this to make things happen. Yeah, thank you. All right, thank you, thank you. Uh, uh, no worries, uh, I see many questions there. Uh, we will collect and uh, collect uh, and uh, we'll pass those questions to our panelists. They will have homework later. <laughs> Sorry for that, uh, to provide some clarifications perhaps. And we will, uh, you know, relay back to whoever uh, asking the questions. So I think, um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, that's all the time we have. Uh, so sorry for that. Um, I know uh, a lot of um, still uh, issues need to be addressed, as already alluded by even uh, the minister, the economic minister, as well as the mostly minister, when they launched this uh, blueprint, talking about challenges ahead that requiring a lot of you know, cooperation. Uh, among us, uh, in particular from the industry. And I'm glad to have good participation from industry, from Mr. Kellen in particular. So hope to see you again uh, in the near future. Yeah. So I pass this uh, forum to the moderator for the next session. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Good job, uh, Professor Dr. Dr. Ghazali. <laughs> Not enough time. Uh, Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, moderator. Uh, sorry, uh, MC. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Ghazali Abbas, uh, to, for moderating the forum just now. Ladies and gentlemen, before we end the forum, I invite uh, the Associate Professor Dr. Zita Abdurrahim, Chair uh, for Center of Global and Business Digital Economy, Faculty of uh, Economics and Management, to, uh, to do the closing remarks. Please welcome, Doctor. Thank you, Dr. Fiza. So we are, uh, we are now at the end of the forum. Before we adjourn this event, allow me to extend my utmost appreciation to our panelists. Dato Insinyur Teknologis Dr. Siti Hamizah Hamizah Tapse, Dato Wi Waluwan Pelu and Madam Ravisa Ghazali for the time and effort that you have taken to enlighten our industrial players uh, with the national for IR policy and also the incentive and financial aids that are available for them. So thank you all again for your contribution. Uh, and we couldn't pull off this forum without the support of our Vice Chancellor and our Dean and all the hard work and dedication of our Professor in Practice, Dr. Ghazali Abbas, and our adjunct Professor, Mr. Michael Warren, for his support in promoting this event. I'm uh, delighted that today we are joined by representative from the embassies of Japan, New Zealand, Finland, Netherlands, and Switzerland as well as British Chamber of Commerce. So congratulations all. Uh, thank you to our guests from various government agencies, including IRB, MIDA, DOSM, EQ, BBB, BNM, and, and many more. Uh, I couldn't read each one of them, yeah? And of course, thank you also to the participation from our various local universities, as well as foreign universities, especially our partners from Indonesia. And last but not least, my utmost appreciation to our organizing team at GLOBE and PTM, and also at EPU, who worked tirelessly from day one to make today's forum a reality. I hope that today's forum has inspired ideas and discussion 
around the ways that we can realize our aspiration as a nation to become a competitive digital economy. Thank you again, everyone, for being here today. And I hope to see you again in our future forum. Thank you. Back to you, uh, Dr. Hafiza. Thank you, Dr. Rosita, for the closing remarks. Now, ladies uh, and gentlemen, um, on behalf of the organizer, I bid farewell to all of you with a note. Thank you very much for joining us today. Please join us again uh, in our future Digital Economy Forum at UKM. And for that, uh, I bid you assalamu alaikum. Stay safe, take care, and goodbye. Bye. Okay, bye everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, if, you, if you would like to take uh, you know, a, a photo, a screenshot of the photo, you may do so. Whoever is left here. Okay. Perhaps Shida, Shida, can you uh, uh, you know do a, a quick screenshot of, of uh, the people here? Okay. Right. Okay. One, two, three. One, two, three. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so thank much, you. everybody. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Okay. Hope to see you thank soon you. again, Dr. Walu. And uh, Professor Dr. Dr. Ghazali, let's work on the next one. Let's work on it, yeah. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you. Michael. Thank, Thank you, bye-bye. Yeah, Dr. Dharma, and many more. Stay safe, everyone. Bye, yeah. Uh, Thank you, bye. Take care, hey, Professor Aini. Uh, Professor Aini, see you again. Bye. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you, bye. Bye, Colin. Thank you. Bye. bye.